An automatic tool length probe is a nice way to avoid manual tool length measurements and to avoid manual touch-offs if the tool holder lacks repeatability. I considered a couple of ways to secure the probe. The first, I uh, used the boss to center the tool probe. This might be nice because you could rotate the probe into any position and possibly help route the wires and uh, tubing. It would also be nice for returning the probe to the same location if it's frequently removed. I chose a simpler method re requiring uh, only a couple of T-nuts to be made. When mounting the probe, just position it somewhere where it's away from the main work and that there's sufficient uh, room around it that it can be centered below the spindle and also uh, consider tools that might need to be offset from the centered such as fly cutters. This probe has an air blast feature for clearing chips and coolant requiring an airline to be attached. The airline is then attached to an air solenoid. The probe is slightly magnetic and perhaps it uses a magnetic switch for a trigger, but the magnet is not strong enough to secure the probe. Wiring is pretty simple. There's two pairs of wires, one for the main probe and one for the overrun sensor. The overrun sensor I wired into the e-stop loop, so if the plunger is depressed more than the stroke link, which is five millimeters, then the e-stop uh, circuit will be opened and the motors will be shut down. The main probe signal can be wired directly into a MESA card. The air solenoid can also be directly connected to a MESA card, but only if protection diodes are used. It may be simpler to use an opto-isolated relay card instead of uh, directly wiring the air solenoid. Configuring Linux CNC is pretty simple. There's only a few lines needed to add an input and to add an output, and then a small amount of debounce uh, to filter the signal from the probe. There were a few times where I had the probe uh, miss trigger, but only with the tool near it. And if it does trigger while the mill is in motion, it will throw an error and uh, uh, any running program will stop. The interface that I made to the probe adds two buttons and an indicator to Linux CNC access. The first button loads the reference tool's length and centers the spindle above the probe. And the second button lowers the tool to the probe, performs the touch-off operation, calculates the length, and then stores the length into a tool table. I use the spindle nose as a reference tool, and to set this up initially, I set the reference tool length to zero, perform the probing operation, and then update the reference tool length. That's saved to a tool table. It doesn't need to be updated unless something changes on the mill. After the reference tool length is known, new tools can be measured. Using the push button interface, the lengths are saved to tool ID 1 in the tool table. But using O code within a G code program, they could be saved to any of the uh, tool IDs. I tested the tool length probe by comparing the automatic measurements to all the measurements of the tools that are in my tool library, which is about 36 tools. It's all the tools listed here that have positive links. And uh, these are the initial measurements, and some of these are pretty bad. Uh, all the measurements here are in microns or in millimeters. And remember that 25 microns is one thousandth of an inch. Uh, I began to investigate the errors here by first remeasuring all of the tools. And some of them I would uh, compare to a stacked set of uh, gauge blocks, just to make certain that my height gauge measurement uh, was accurate. One source of error that I found was if I press down onto the TTS tool holder, uh, it would change the length by a thousandth of an inch. And pressing down is a better representation of how the tool will ultimately be held in the spindle when it's pulled up into the spindle by the TTS uh, holding collet. And care has to be taken when measuring tools that have inserts like this modular insert tool that you measure to the tip of the insert and ideally check all of the inserts to make certain that they are consistent. The next source of error that I looked at was backlash and I measured backlash as a difference between when the tool length probe is triggered on the downstroke versus as it's being lifted off of the tool length uh, gauge. And I measure the backlash at two different approach speeds. So 200 millimeters per minute uh, 
and 20 millimeters per minute. And the backlash changes a little bit, but it's uh, nothing that's very substantial. The average between them is roughly uh, 50 micron or two thousandths of an inch. And that's pretty in line with uh, what I see on uh, my mill. It's about one and a half thousandths of backlash and, and really all of the axes. The, the next source of air is um, the repeatability of the homing operation. So the way I am using the tool length probe, it's dependent upon the home position being consistent and then the distance between the uh, home position and the reference tool being consistent. And my reference tool is the uh, nose of the spindle. So I measure the repeatability of homing by uh, performing a home operation on the z-axis and then lowering the Heimer probe down to uh, tell it red zero. And there's two different velocities that are used during homing. There is a search velocity and the latching velocity. The search velocity is the first one that's used. So it's the speed at which the axis approaches the target. And once the target is found, it backs off and then approaches at the latching velocity, or it backs off of the target at the latching velocity, depending upon if uh, the latching velocity is positive or negative. So there's four possibilities then. And these are the, um, the individual measurements for each of the um, uh, homing uh, velocities, latching and, and uh, search velocities, and whether the uh, sensor was initially on the target or not, the, the homes, a homing sensor was on the target or not. What it comes down to is the repeatability is within um, three microns uh, or one-tenth of uh, an inch. And as long as the, uh, the probe, the tool length probe and the homing operation is done in the same direction, then the backlash isn't going to matter. The backlash has already been um, consumed by the, the movement. The next source of error that I looked at was if I got a different measurement if I rotated the spindle. And I also tried to concentrate the surface, the contact of the spindle, to a point using a ball. And of course all these measurements are repeated um, generally five times to get a distribution. The spindle nose repeatability, again this is changing positions of the uh, spindle uh, nose, it's plus minus five micron for the for the majority of times. Next, I tried repeating the case a, a tool that has a very sharp point, and this I could just let run in a loop. Again, the majority of the measurements are plus minus five micron. So the repeatability of the tool length probe is really high, and this is probably what led me to. Uh, down this rabbit hole of trying to get this probe to be highly accurate. After remeasuring the tools of the surface plate, the mean difference between the, the two methods is about 120 uh, microns. So we're improving, but uh, it's, it's still pretty bad. There's also a, a, a bias here, right? So you could simply subtract off roughly 55 micron and have a substantial improvement. Another potential source of error is that the tool is tilted. And if it is tilted, it will appear shorter than it is as it moves along the Z axis. Now you can estimate that tilt by doing the trigonometry using the length of the touch from the touch probe and the length measured at the surface plate. But we can do better than that because we have some sense of the uncertainty that's present in those uh, measurements. At the touch probe, it's somewhere between five and a uh, plus minus five and plus minus six micron. And at the surface plate, because I lower the height gauge onto the tool, I'm pretty certain it's not uh, less than the length that I measured. But the uh, precision of the instrument is one thousandth of an inch, so it could be upwards of 25 micron longer than my measurement. So the uncertainty of the touch probe plus minus five, six micron, the uncertainty of the surface plate minus zero plus 25 micron. So for every tool, I have a length of the touch probe and the surface plate, and I can do that trigonometry to estimate an angle. But for those, those pairs of measurements, I can add in values selected from uniform distributions that represent the uncertainty and get new uh, new pairs to estimate the tilt from.
So after doing that millions of times, you get a median tilt potentially of 2.1 degrees. And this is a, a pretty severe uh, tilt, but this explains the data uh, pretty well. And an error in tilt becomes especially important for longer tools. To check if there is a tilt, the quickest way is to lay a square into the vise and then run a dial test indicator across the surface of the square. But we can do better. The first thing to do is to check if the machine is level. And mine was not. The next thing to do is to check if the head is tilted with respect to the column. And we do this by attaching a dial test indicator with a magnetic base onto the column of the mill and then run a rod uh, mounted in, the, uh, in a collet. This sort of tilt has to do with the rotation of the head around its pivot point and just requires the head to be rotated back so that it's a square. While doing this, I found that one of the two securing bolts of the head had no threads left. It was actually hard to get the nut off of the, uh, the bolt. One of the first things I did with my mill was install these tramming aids. That corrects the tilt of the head around the pivot point. Now we have to correct for the tilt of the head away from uh, the column. And we check if this is necessary by measure on the back side of our rod. And if any adjustment is needed, it requires shims to be put behind the head. Now that the head is aligned to the column, we have to align the column to the table. And you check if this is necessary by rotating a dial test indicator across the surface of the uh, table. If any correction is necessary, it requires shimming to be done under the column. Start by first loosening the bolt securing the column to the base and then chipping away any of the Bondo-like stuff that uh, may get pushed underneath of the column accidentally. You can do the trigonometry to estimate how much shim stock is needed, but it's easy as just to try out some combinations. Now that the mill is trimmed, I need to check that the tool length probe is flat. And by flat, I mean that it gives a consistent reading regardless of where it is pressed. And to test this, I use a tool with a sharp point and I measure its length in a grid pattern across the surface of the probe. And you can see that there is a, a good amount of variation as we move across the surface of the probe of, of 30 microns. I also tried some extreme cases such as loading up the edge of the table with uh, 40 pounds of lead shot and moving the tool length probe to different positions. To correct for that tilt in the tool length probe, I first remove the paint from the bottom of the probe. And after shimming, there still is this uh, convexity uh, to the to the surface, uh, but at, at least it's pretty uniform at a given radius. After this is done, the surface of the probe will not be perfectly flat. The next source of error to consider is following error, and following error is the difference between a servo's commanded position and its actual position. I've shown this before a few times. Uh, this is code that I wrote after reverse engineering the lead shine easy servo uh, communication protocol. And using this, I can pull out the following error and synchronize it to operations that Linux CNC uh, is performing. The greatest amount of following error is expected when a heavy object is moved fast. Onto this graph, we can superimpose the following error from a probing operation to get a sense of the magnitude. The following error is pretty consistent during a probing operation. Here, uh, three probing operations were done and they're superimposed and they look uh, very similar. The individual phases of probing can be identified and highlighted. First, first there's fast probing where the tool is moving relatively fast and the probe is searching for that first contact. Then there's dwelling and dwelling is a half second delay and this is to break up any uh, potential path blending that's taking place between the two probing operations. The slow probing is where the tool is lifted slowly off of the uh, tool length probe. And this is done at an order of magnitude slower uh, rate of speed than uh, fast probing is done. And this is to give a higher precision. And then finally, a retraction. And this is a rapid away from the tool probe back to uh, G53Z0. Uh, this graph suggests that following error may contribute 10 microns of error to the overall length but it's consistent, and if it's consistent, we can adjust for that.
After making the mechanical improvements, such as tramming, the difference between the manual and the automatic measurements has improved, but there still is a considerable amount of error. Again, if we look at explaining this as uh, a tool tilt error, we have a measurement of 1.8 degrees compared to the previous measurement of 2.1, and that 0.3 degree measurement is right in line with what would be expected given the shimming that was uh, performed. The next source of error that we'll consider is how the tool touches the probe. This is a traditional end mill, and it's easy to see that the end mill only touches the probe at its outer diameter. If we plot the half inch end mill as a circle onto the probe elevation map, we can see there's potentially 30 microns of error that's accounted for by the convexity of the probe response surface. In addition to error being proportional to the diameter of the tool and could be attributed to the convexity of the probe response surface, there is also error that is proportional to the length of the tool and could be attributed to the tool being at a tilt. The longer the tool, the greater the contribution of this error. The overall error can then be estimated by combining two models. A model that considers diameter and length makes perfect sense for any tool that will fit onto the tool length probe and makes contact only at the outer circumference of the tool. But modeling error as a function of diameter doesn't make sense for tools like drills that have a single point of contact but are very long, or fly cutters that have a single point of contact and a very large diameter, or face mills that are so large that they won't fit onto the touch probe and they have to be offset with a single insert touching the uh, touch probe. In these cases, the error can be modeled as a function of length alone. After building these models using these squares, we can look at the difference between the manual and the modeled error and see that the majority of the error now lies between plus minus 12 micron uh, with a range between minus 25 to positive 25 micron. A 12 micron of that could be explained by following error and the remainder by a multitude of unknown sources including egregious error on my own part. But substantial improvements were made from starting at, you know, more re realistically 120 micron error, uh, getting that down to 28 micron of, of, of average error, uh, and then down to plus minus, let's say 12 uh, micron of error using a uh, model adjustment. If the error of measurements can be reliably predicted, the measurements can be adjusted. But the problem with using a model of error is that if any of the underlying assumptions of the model changes, the model is invalid and has to be rebuilt. In this case, since we don't fully understand the sources of the error that's being modeled, anything that changes on the mill could invalidate the model. Obvious ones that would invalidate the model are uh, include tramming uh, or changing the reference surface, but there could be uh, unexpected ones, such as changing the approach speed, um, tightening the gibs on the z-axis, which, which would change the, the following error. Um, we just don't know. So, yeah. During this project, eliminating error from the tool link probe became a bit of an obsession. I spent more time on this than it's likely worth, but the high repeatability of the tool link probe kind of suckered me into trying to achieve high accuracy. I can recommend the tool length probe without hesitation and will use it for tools that I change frequently, especially drill bits. For tools that I change infrequently, like end mills, I'll probably continue to measure those at the surface plate and then make small adjustments in length following test cuts. But let me know your suggestions and what I could have done better. And finally, thank you for your interest and support. It means a lot to me.